Hello everyone and welcome to another Real People Big Astronomy program. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I am a member of the Big Astronomy Leadership Team and I am the Planetarium Director at the Peoria Riverfront Museum in Peoria, Illinois. I'm excited to have with me today a fantastic panel of other planetarium professionals, um, all of which I'm, I'm grateful to have been able to collaborate and work with in uh, different aspects of my planetarium career and, and now here um, with the Big Astronomy Program. But today, um, all of our panelists are going to share with you and with me um, some aspects of how working in a planetarium is a STEM career um, and how even though uh, all of our panelists work in different kinds of planetariums um, that the, and they have uh, different roles in their planetariums. All of our jobs help educate people about space and science and um, astronomy. So we hope to share a little bit about that with you all today. But first, let me just briefly mention what the Big Astronomy Program is. Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded project it includes multiple aspects. It includes a planetarium show that was uh, filmed in both English and Spanish and is available for free or at very low cost um, at planetariums around the world. And the California Academy of Sciences, where um, Mary Holt works, uh, helped create that show. Um, and you can find out more information about how to get it in your planetarium if you're in one uh, at uh, bigastronomy.org. It also includes this live event series in which we talk with STEM professionals who work at the observatories and other STEM careers um, and talk about their career paths. It includes an activity of kit of uh, materials, excuse me, an activity kit of materials made by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and educational research that's being done by Michigan State University. So if you'd like to um, contribute to that, we'll have a way for you to be able to do so at the end. If you're joining us here on Zoom, there is Spanish interpretation available. So if you'd like to uh, make use of that, just click on the interpretation widget at the bottom of your screen. If you are watching us on Facebook Live and you would like to hear this program in Spanish, you can just uh, join the Zoom program to do that. And there's a link to do so in our Facebook event. And finally, if you have questions during the program, either leave a comment on the Facebook Live um, comments or here in the Zoom window and make sure your, um, your chat function is going to everyone and we will do our best to answer those questions for you. Uh, but to get started here, I'd like to introduce our um, panelists. So thank you all so much for being here today. I am going to share my screen because I have some nice pictures show that our panelists put together um, showing them in their workplace. Um, so I have you listed in alphabetical order um, in the event uh, that uh, advertisement. So I think I'll start there alphabetical by last name. So um, let's start with Mary Holt, who is a planetarium programs specialist at the California Academy of Science. Um, Mary, could you tell us just a little bit about your job and um, about what you do, about yourself and about what you do for your job in your planetarium? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name is Mary Holt. I work uh, at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Um, and I've worked in planetariums for oof, uh, about, I mean, working as a staff member for about 10 years now and then volunteering slash working in planetariums for about 11 years. Um, I started when I was in uh, college at University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but uh, what I do for my job, you can see a few examples here. I do online programming, which you can see on the left, I'm doing a, a school show for kindergartners through second graders, uh, pretending to make a telescope in that image there. Uh, in the middle one, you can see a recent picture of me in our planetarium. We are currently wearing masks due to COVID and whatnot, but we are giving shows inside of our planetarium. Uh, and then the picture on the right is from a couple of years ago in uh, one of our spaces that I work in a lot as a specialist. I work um, a lot in our Hofeld Hall area, which is basically 
um, the entryway to the planetarium, but also we do live programs in there. So I write uh, the scripts for our live programming is the majority of what my job is and uh, training our presenters to give live programs. So, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and you work, you're at the California, maybe just a little bit of context for people who might be familiar, the California Academy of Sciences is a, a museum planetarium. Yes, it is a science museum that has a rainforest, it has a aquarium, and it has a planetarium, and we also have a natural history museum all within, we like to say all under one living roof, because we have, a, <laughs> the roof is a, a living roof with plants and uh, native Californian plants and things like that. Uh, so yeah, so it's a science museum, and I work in the planetarium that's within the science museum. So uh, thank you, Mary, for sharing a little bit about your job. Our, our next panelist is Jeff Holt, who is a planetarium director at the Madison Metro School District Planetarium. So Jeff, could you tell us a little bit um, about your job, uh, about yourself and about your job? Sure. Um, so I'm kind of uh, on the other end of the, the spectrum uh, from Mary. Um, my planetarium is just a 30 foot, uh, nine meter dome. Uh, located in high school, and I am the only staff member. And so um, I may be listed as the director, but I'm the director of myself, uh, the facilities, and uh, we offer basically three services. Um, we have a telescope loan program. We have uh, virtual uh, events, uh, especially during these, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we do have uh, classes at the high school that are utilizing the planetarium uh, even uh, during the pandemic. And so I am supporting the astronomy teacher. And when we have uh, other uh, classes come in, I will be uh, presenting under the dome. I'm looking forward to that uh, for those high school classes. Uh, so since I'm the only staff member, that means that I am kind of the reservation secretary. Um, I keep track of the finances. Um, I have to do all of the, the ordering for equipment. Um, I'm also the uh, maintenance person, uh, electrical technician. Uh, so pretty much um, have to do everything. Uh, that's actually one of the things that I like about my job. Um, and the other uh, thing that I kind of like uh, as far as like a broad spectrum is I get to work with um, all ages, all the way from uh, preschool to um, to adults, and um, I guess one of the other aspects, uh, you know, supporting those services that we provide is a reservation secretary, uh, so that I'm setting up the reservations for the telescope loans and uh, all of the events. It's one of the things that I've found so interesting about getting to know the planetary people who work in planetariums and the planetarium field is there are so many different kinds of planetariums and different roles that, that people can play in planetariums. Uh, thank you for sharing, Jeff. Um, so next is Mitch Blumen, who is the Dorothy and George Encamp Director of Science Experiences at the Evansville Museum of Arts, History, and Science. Um, so Mitch, can you share with us just a little bit about yourself and about uh, what you do for your job? Hola, hi everyone. My name is Mitchell and uh, I'm joining you today from the Midwest of the North American continent here in Southern Indiana, where I direct the operations of a planetarium and a small science center at a museum located in Southern Indiana. Uh, our museum has had a planetarium for many decades and uh, the biggest challenge that I had in my career was actually improving that planetarium because uh, the planetarium dated back to the 1950s and it really needed a refresh. And uh, it was a huge challenge in order to create a planetarium where one had already existed and people had to ask themselves, well, why do we need a new one? But the new planetarium at our museum is a digital planetarium. And if there's a a planetarium near you, whether it be in a school or whether it be in a museum or even in a college, I'd encourage you to seek it out because people in planetariums are doing astronomy education all the time. And uh, there are planetarium shows you can see and learn about the sky at night. And there's nothing 
anything like a planetarium in order to, uh, to give you that experience. Thank you, Mitch. I saw uh, all of our panelists nodding their heads in agreement. I know that we are, of course, going to be a bit biased. We all love planetariums. We work in planetariums, but they are really special places. Um, and, and you're right, no matter if it's a, a school planetarium or a museum planetarium or a planetarium at um, a university or college. Uh, so our next panelist is Carissa Sidor, who is a planetarium producer at the Buell Planetarium at the Carnegie Science Center. Um, so we have uh, panelists today who are from planetariums um, all across the United States. So Carissa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your job? Sure. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Renee said, my name is Carissa Sidor, and I work for the Buell Planetarium at Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and my title is planetarium producer. So uh, like pretty much all other planetarium people, I wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> um, I think we all tend to do a lot of different things, but most of what I do is dealing with the technology that we have in our theater. Um, our theater is a digital theater. So we have fun full dome capabilities as well as really cool digital software that we can use to show different visuals. Um, so most of what I do is program those visuals and, and make all of the different shows that we show here. So if we're showing a show about the moon or if it's about robots in our solar system or if it's about uh, different features of Mars. Um, all of that has a lot of different programming behind it. So it's my job to kind of script everything and make it look nice, basically. Um, I also do a lot of the maintenance of our technology here. So we've got a lot of computers. We have about 20 computers that we use here uh, to run day to day. So I have to take care of all of them, make sure they're working, um, which they like to not do as computers, <laughs> as computers are. Um, but we also have an observatory here at the Science Center. Um, so sometimes I'm up using our telescope. Um, I also present a lot of shows uh, and help write our science content, our, our show content as well. So uh, lots of different kinds of things, but mostly I like to do my production stuff and making all the fun shows for everyone to see. Thank you, Carissa. Um, I'm reminded, yeah, again, that just like in observatories, there's a lot of different roles for a lot of different people. Uh, I think the same is true in uh, planetariums, or you might uh, have a smaller operation. You do all those roles all at once. <laughs> um, but uh, finally, Dana Thompson is the planetarium director at the Charles W. Brown Planetarium at Ball State University. And Dana, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what your role at your planetarium? Happy to, Renee. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium here at Ball State University. And at Ball State University, we have something we like to call the cultural corridor, where we have a greenhouse, an art museum, a glass center, uh, theater spaces, and many other community engagement opportunities that we, we welcome um, everyone to come and visit. And many of the things that we offer are actually free. Um, well, what we focus on here in the planetarium is, of course, science communication. We host school groups, uh, public programming, and we see thousands of people every year coming for free to our programs. And what we really try to do is have conversations about science with our visitors in creative and memorable ways. Um, and so what I do um, and what I've done for many years here, this is my 10th or 11th year, I think, working inside of a planetarium. Um, and most of that time, I was actually the only full-time person. Uh, we just recently hired another full-time person. Um, so I, I, like many other people on the panel here, took on many different roles. Um, so what I do is uh, create content. I am the director of that content. I write scripts for that content. I manage the programming of it. I also create 3D programming. I record sound and edit that sound for programs. Uh, so I do a lot of different things within um, content creation here. Uh, we also present programs live in interactive ways um, to our, our guests coming through. And um, I play a role in just all of the operations of the planetarium, designing hands-on activities that we do here, but then also maintaining and upgrading the technology that we use. 
And I also take a lot of the photos that we use for social media. Um, so I actually took the photo on the left here. I did not take the one at the controls on the right. Um, but uh, that's why there are some dated pictures here that I need to update because uh, I'm often on the other side of the camera for all of our events. Well, thank you all so much for uh, telling us about uh, what uh, just the briefest way about what you do for your job, because I know that for all of you, there's many more aspects of your job that you probably can't um, describe in a concise way. But um, one question I have um, for everyone here, um, because it's something we sometimes um, sort of joke about in uh, planetarium conversations, is that it's very rare that somebody might, you know, wake up one day and think, I want to work in a planetarium. That's not typically how people find their way to this career path, but maybe if we share a little bit about it, people will as young people. So um, my question for you is, how how did you find your your way to this career path? And um, did, you know, what was it that sparked the interest in pursuing a career in a planetarium for you? Um, and maybe we can start with um, Mitch. Could Would you like to share what it was that led you to this uh, career? Hello again, everybody. Uh, when I was 12, uh, I was presented with a telescope. And uh, this is probably going to sound uh, like a, a lot of different answers. And I know a lot of people out there probably have telescopes, maybe under your bed or in a closet somewhere. But I would encourage you to get that out and uh, give it a shot looking at the moon or the bright planets this time of the year, because that's kind of what I did when I was 12 years old. And I've been an amateur astronomer ever since. I'll, I'll take my telescope out and look at things even to this day. Oh, I eventually wound up in college like a lot of folks and was training to be a high school teacher and um, had an experience at a museum. And that was a wonderful experience. It opened my eyes to a kind of education that uh, I didn't even know existed. And although I trained as a high school teacher and I find myself working in a informal institution, a, a museum, I truly enjoy what I do because a lot of times the educators that you find in the museums, such as myself and others, uh, we have the same background and we have the same qualifications as teachers in the schools. It's just that we don't teach in a formal setting, we teach in a museum setting. And you can learn so much in school and you can learn uh, just about as much in informal institutions. And uh, I got my start because uh, I was always interested in astronomy and I still am to this day. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, who, anyone else have a, a story to share about your path, how you uh, got down this path of, of working in a, in a planetarium? I could go um, because it's a little different than Mitch's. I wasn't always interested in astronomy. Um, I did like astronomy stories. I, of course, watched Star Trek going, growing up. Um, but when my dad brought out the telescope and tried showing us some planets, I was like, yeah, that's cool, but what else is there to do? Um, so what kind of got me interested in informal education or informal science um, environments and working in them is the hands-on activities and the conversations that can happen and just you know, working together to try to figure out problems and not being isolated, taking a test by yourself, because I don't feel like that's really representative to some of the work that's being done in the world. And so that opened my eyes to just a new way of education, kind of like what Mitch was saying. Um, so when I went to school, I actually got my bachelor's degree in physics because I learned about particle physics in high school through a Nova special. Um, and I thought that that was just one of the most interesting things. Um, but looking back, I think I really liked the storytelling that was involved um, more than maybe the science um, and understanding that science and doing the research to learn more about that. Um, even though I was really good at math and I got my bachelor's in physics and then I went on to get my master's in physics, it was when I was working as a graduate student in a planetarium that I realized that that was the place for me. So I actually did decide to go into the planetarium field um, but it wasn't until I was a grad student much, much later um, after learning all the things about physics and, and wanting to share that with the world. 
Uh, that's fantastic. I, I, you had a word that stuck out to me, which was storytelling. And I have heard it um, described by many people that working in a planetarium, um, it, one of our main uh, roles is to be a storyteller. And I think if we um, are doing our jobs well with our audiences, hopefully we're, we're being storytellers and sharing stories of science. Um, but on a slightly different topic, I have a, another question, which is, um, about challenges. We like to ask people who are in the, whatever career path they might be in about what has been a, a challenge in their career and how they dealt with it. Because one thing that's universal is that everyone's career will have challenges and, and hopefully um, there are challenges that we can overcome. So um, uh, Jeff, we haven't heard from you in a moment. Can you share with us if you had a, a challenge in your career and, and how you might have overcome it? Um, well, the one that came to mind when you said that was um, when I first started in the district, um, you know, budgets were, you know, pretty strong, uh, but uh, that diminished uh, pretty quickly to the point where um, about 10 years in, um, the planetarium found itself on the cut list uh, every spring as the school district was uh, putting together a budget. And every year my supervisor would say, don't worry, they'll take it off the cut list. Uh, and um, eventually it made it all the way to the very last school board meeting. Uh, and uh, I found myself actually speaking uh, to the board and was happy to see that other people uh, were there to speak on behalf of the planetarium as well. And after that um, close call, um, I decided I needed to kind of uh, step up our kind of public uh, image. And uh, we worked to get a new logo for the planetarium. Uh, so there was kind of some PR uh, stuff that we did. And we also just kind of stepped up the, um, the effort that we were putting into um, our public events. Uh, it coordinated very nicely with around the time that my boys were going off to college. And so I wasn't always, you know, going to sporting events and I could uh, spend more time on the public programming. Uh, but uh, very quickly, we expanded from having just two uh, public events per month to having sometimes as, as many as uh, 10. And uh, so that, um, that worked out uh, pretty well in a period of about um, three or four years, we, we really grew the program quite a bit. Anyone else have a story to share about a challenge in their career that they've uh, had to overcome? Uh, one that I thought of when thinking about this question was just one a, a part of the planetarium field that is a good thing and also a bad thing, which is that it's very, very small. <laughs> so it's a very small community, which is great in the sense that like, I get to chat with wonderful people like you. We go to conferences together and stuff. And like, it's not too challenging to get to know people and like have networks and stuff within the community because it is so small, but also that makes it so there's not as many like clear opportunities for moving around or growth. So often you have to either be very patient or very creative in order to uh, move around in the industry. So it's, has its pluses and its minuses. And for me personally, I feel like a way that I approach that or deal with it is, is by getting to know people and is being part of the community and being active in the community, which I think is a huge plus just as a personal, like makes me feel fulfilled in life and also is a plus for a career path as well. Yeah, Mary, uh, my advisor in college many years ago told me that I would never get a job in a planetarium because there were too few of them and too many people probably wanting to uh, have those posts. And for anybody who's thinking of a planetarium career, don't be dissuaded. Uh, even though it is a small industry, uh, talented people have a way of rising and uh, meeting the occasion. So um, the talented people that you see here are people who, um, are good at what they do and uh, they'll keep doing it. So uh, if you're good at what you do and you have a passion for astronomy, uh, there's a place for you in the planetarium industry. 
And uh, thank you both Mary and, and Mitch for those words of encouragement. Um, and Chris, I know you were, you were about to jump in, uh, so I didn't wanna cut you off if you had a story to share. Uh, oh, mine was not nearly as uh, <laughs> philosophical or inspiring, um, but I know a lot of challenges are dealt with, uh, especially working for like nonprofit museums and budgets are very tight. Um, so we had uh, probably one of the biggest challenges that I dealt with was um, the system that we used was very old and uh, very quickly um, becoming not functional. So, uh, trying to overcome that and, and get an upgrade in place was a really big challenge. And it actually took about four years of work for us to get everything ready. So that was something that uh, we were really proud of that we were able to do is upgrade our system this past year. Um, because you have a lot of, we have a lot of different technology in planetariums. I'm probably gonna talk about that a lot because that's the main part of my job. Um, but I don't think a lot of people realize just how technological planetariums are, um, like a modern planetarium is uses a lot of different amazing things. It's a very complex system and it's very hard to keep running and it doesn't always want to run. So um, keeping something going like that is a huge challenge, um, but it's also really rewarding when it does work out and when you can figure out a problem. Um, so getting a big thing like that fixed and, and getting some new stuff was a really exciting challenge that we got to take on. Well, I'm not the person uh, being featured here. I'm the host, but I have to uh, say that I had a very similar experience this year. I had been keeping my very aging planetarium system limp limping along for so long. There were pieces being held together by duct tape. And then uh, we finally got the, the funding to upgrade it. And that was such a tremendous relief. So I certainly empathize with that. And I know many other folks in the planetarium field um, would probably agree that if you need a, a technology upgrade, just keeping your system going while you're waiting for the, the funding for that uh, can be such a challenge. So congratulations, Chris. I'm, I'm very glad for you that you were able to um, find the funding to upgrade your system. Okay, well, let's uh, change uh, change paths just a little bit here. So we've talked about challenges to your career, some of the things about working in a planetarium that maybe, you know, aren't so excellent. Um, but we've also shared a lot about uh, how we all enjoy working in planetarium. So now I get to ask, uh, what is your favorite thing about your job? Could you describe a little bit about um, what it is about your job that you really enjoy? And let's uh, start with Dana. Sure. Um, definitely the variety. Uh, so we've kind of mentioned that we wear a lot of hats as planetarians. Um, and of course, variety is a part of that. Um, and so I get to uh, collaborate with other people as well. And I really enjoy doing that. So there are some days that I'm working with the greenhouse on campus to have a group event um, between both of our sites um, where they go and enjoy something at the greenhouse and something similar at the planetarium, of course, in, in different ways. Um, and then other days I'm working with professors in the, in the geography and meteorology department here on campus, since we are in a university, um, we get to do a lot of uh, research in the planetarium and other cool projects with the professors here. But then we also invite the school groups that come in um, and we get to have kids come in and learn and watch Sesame Street programs in the planetarium. So there's just so much variety. Um, I get to work with a lot of different ages, um, as Jeff mentioned before, uh, preschool through college and then on to adults um, and lifelong learning events. Um, but then um, I get to beyond working with different people and on different projects, um, I get to do a lot of different jobs like post on social media, design new posters and programs for upcoming events. Uh, so one of the things that really drew me into the planetarium field beyond what I've already mentioned is the creativity that comes with it um, and being able to be creative and design things and, you know, put ideas onto paper or onto the dome, so to speak. Wonderful. Who else has a, has a something to share? Carissa? I do want to piggyback off of that because that was kind of what I was going to say too. Um, one of the kind of career things I was looking at before I even knew, like really understood what it, 
a planetarium was, was uh, looking into film and creative writing. I always really loved that when I was a, when I was younger and I always wanted to do something creative. And it wasn't until I took a physics class in my, you know, upper high school years that I realized I liked space that much. Um, so I really do love how much we are able to kind of harness creativity in everything that we do. Um, there is so much, it goes back to that storytelling aspect, right? We have to convey a lot of sometimes really complex subject matter, sometimes stuff that's really lofty, that's very hard to explain. And we have to make it, I mean, it's not hard to make it interesting, I don't think, but I'm biased, but um, make it understandable and, and make it so that any age level can understand to a degree what we're talking about. And there's a lot of different fun ways that you can do that. So the chance to kind of use that creativity in, in how we present information, but also creativity and how we display things and the different themes we can give things. And there's so many different ways that you can present a subject. Um, so I really like being able to have a lot of fun with that. I could definitely say that uh, I enjoy the the creativity part, um, but I think if I had to choose, you know, something that uh, brings me uh, the most joy and satisfaction, it's uh, the interactions with people. Because um, I always knew, I, like Mitch, I came from the the teacher uh, route. I uh, was a middle school science teacher for uh, six years, um, and just the interaction with people, uh, those aha moments uh, are priceless. Um, I love to make people uh, smile, uh, roll their eyes, laugh, whatever, you know, uh, reaction uh, I can get. And uh, those moments when um, you, you know, like you see, uh, especially kids, you know, walking in under the dome and just saying, wow, you know, or uh, you help them to, you know, figure out something and their mind is just, you know, blown away. Um, those are the, the most satisfying moments for me. Uh, well, thank you all for those uh, lovely answers. I, and you're making it sound so appealing, I think, to many of our, our viewers about working in a planetarium. And it is appealing, like Mitch said, seek a planetarium out if you have one near you. Um, so, uh, one well let's see we have two two more questions um before we take a few audience questions but uh, i'm going to combine one here um so i asked you to think about what a typical day at work might be and what a typical day at home might be so let's combine those a little bit if anyone cares to share um the, one of the things I'll say is that we've talked about the variety, so you might not have a typical day at work. But uh, if you, who wants to share a little bit about what their typical day at work might be and how that might uh, relate to? Um, actually, I'm changing my mind. We'll talk about what our typical day at work will be, and then I'm going to combine the um, what you like. What is your day at home like with my last question, which is what you like to do for fun. So, um, Mary, can you start us off telling us about your typical day at work? Yeah, uh, today is an interesting example, actually, because as you can probably tell, I am home right now. Um, so I work from home a couple of days a week now, uh, which was new since the pandemic. It's kind of nice to have a couple of days to work at home and a few days on site. Uh, but when I am on site, uh, it depends partly on what my role is that day, because we have a couple of different roles within a particular day. So we might have where I'm just the backup person for whoever's in the planetarium that day. So I might be working on a project. I might be having some meetings with folks. Maybe I'm working on like a new school show or a new hotel show or like a new show of some sort. Or um, I'm also active in some of the other like committees and things that we have at our museum. So for example, we have like a di diversity, equity and inclusion committee that I'm uh, involved with. So I might be meeting with people about that. Um, but then if I'm the, the planetarium person for the day, I give at least like four or five shows and our shows uh, vary between shows that are completely live where I'm talking for 20 to 30 minutes, or we also do shows like Big Astronomy. Uh, and then we have like a short section with Big Astronomy, for example, where we talk about a uh, discovery that was made with one of the telescopes that you learn about in the show. So um, 
yeah, so that's kind of a snippet of what I might do on a typical day if I'm in the museum. Mitch, can you share with us? Yeah, from what you're going to hear from me, it's going to sound like I, I, I live sleep and uh, do everything else uh, astronomy related, but I am a dad and a grandfather and a husband, and uh, I find time for that, of course, family first. But uh, I mentioned earlier that I've been an amateur astronomer since I was 12. I, I have a half meter telescope that I use, and my favorite object to look at is galaxies. So on a moonless night, which are the best nights for doing my hobby, I'm usually out looking at galaxies and nebula with my half meter telescope. Uh, Saturday night was uh, watch the moon night. And so I was helping Girl Scouts and people in our community observe the moon. And it was a beautiful clear day in this part of the country to do that first chilly day of fall uh, at the museum that where I work in the planetarium. As everyone said, keeping the technology working is, is a lot of fun actually to, uh, to have a problem and to be able to solve it. Uh, using just your own resources or other resources that you can call on is really rewarding. Uh, typical day at work is keeping our science museum open, managing uh, the, my small staff that I have. And then of course, doing those planetarium shows, which is the main reason that planetariums exist to educate people. So I'm a little bit non-typical of, of most people who work in planetariums in that uh, my hobby is also my profession. And I just need to squeeze in there. I also teach at my local college. So uh, I love astronomy. What can I say? So basically, Mitch, you have a lot of free time, but you don't, you don't have anything going on at all is what you're telling us. <laughs> I'm being, of course, completely, uh, completely sarcastic there. Uh, I enjoy how you're uh, so passionate about astronomy, Mitch, that it's part of your personal life as well as your professional life. Um, but we are kind of closing into the uh, end of our program here today. We have a couple audience questions, but I don't want to uh, miss sharing a few uh, pictures that all of our uh, panelists have assembled. Thank you, everyone, for for taking the time to do that, because um, one of the goals of these Real People Big Astronomy programs is to help, of course, everyone understand that any professional is a whole person who is not just their job, that they have um, hobbies outside of their job, they have lives outside of their jobs as well. So we like to ask uh, that, that last question is, um, what do you like to do for, like, what was a, a day at home like for you combined with um, what do you like to do for fun? Um, and Mitch, you were just telling us a little bit um, about that, uh, about your passion for astronomy. That's a great big Dobsonian you've got there in this picture that I'm, I'm sharing here. But um, if there's any other of these pictures that you didn't touch on when you were telling us that, maybe you can describe what's happening. I'm going to be really brief and, and say that uh, I love to do things outdoors. Uh, I love to kayak and also backpack. And occasionally I'll do backseat uh, plane flights. I'll pass it on to others. So uh, I do have time for this. Uh, okay, so uh, these are pictures Jeff put together. Jeff, can you tell us um, about your day, days at home and, and what you like to do uh, for enjoyment? Well, uh, days at home is just my wife and I, so nothing exciting here, but we live for our moments to uh, spend time with our granddaughter. Um, but uh, for fun, uh, like Mitch, I like to do things outside, uh, anything uh, in, on, or under uh, the water. Uh, and uh, backpack, hike, um, just love the outdoors. A beautiful picture of you a water skiing there, Jeff. Uh, looks That's like a fun. big backpack, Jeff. Uh, how many pounds are in that backpack? About 60 pounds. That's a 10-day trip that I do, uh, a co-lead. Um, it's a grad school program for teachers. Yeah, you'd, you'd need at least 50 pounds for a trip that, that large. Kudos to you. Thanks. Oh, so these are pictures that Mary put together for us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you like to do for fun and, and a little bit of what a home day might be like for you, Mary? Yeah, uh, I didn't respond about the, the what's your favorite part of the job thing, but I agree with Jeff and that um, the people is like huge for me. And that's true. My personal life, too. I just most of the time I'm spending doing anything is just with people that I like and love. So these are 
examples of hanging out with, with my nieces and uh, my sister. So I actually live with one of my nieces. I don't know. She's not running around currently, but often she's running around in the background and screaming and whatnot. She's adorable. Uh, but I have two other nieces nearby as well. Um, and I love going hiking. That middle one is me and my boyfriend in Yosemite, uh, which is one of my favorite places in the entire world. Um, and recently I've gotten to get back into one of my other favorite things, which is traveling. So the picture on the right was my first time, did a quick trip up to Seattle. Um, I've never been up there before, but I got to visit with uh, another planetarian actually, Aaron uh, is in that picture as well. But um, so yeah, so hanging out with people, exploring new places are a couple of my favorite things to do anytime. Fantastic. And uh, Carissa, you sent me some of these uh, pictures, fantastic travel pictures. And I think one of these is, is a bit recent, if, if I'm right about that. Yes, so one of those is just from last week. Um, so I guess what I'm learning here is that we need to start a planetarium hiking group. Um, <laughs> Let's so let's get on that. Uh, so like a lot of other folks here, I love doing all stuff outdoors um, and traveling as much as possible, which of course has been very hard the past uh, year or so, but uh, starting to get out a little bit more, um, especially over COVID though, I tried to start hiking pretty much every week. So um, that was something really fun that I was able to do safely. Um, I love kayaking, I love doing stuff outdoors, but I also like doing stuff indoors. I love playing video games. Um, I always say that I like working the planetarium because I basically get to play video games for a living. Um, so uh, that works out too. So, but anything, uh, all sorts of different things, love doing stuff uh, inside and outside. And uh, Dana, I love these pictures of you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you like to do for fun? Sure. Uh, so with the pictures, of course, roller skating, but um, uh, I play roller derby, um, which is a little bit different than some people might think. Uh, it's a flat track derby association that I'm a part of. Um, and we play competitively. Uh, so we haven't been practicing since March of 2020. I actually led the last practice um, before we went into quarantine due to COVID. Um, but for my second year as a part of this roller derby community, um, I was the president of the league, uh, which we are the corn fed derby dames. Um, and then the two years after that, I was um, a part of the practice committee. So I led practices and workshops for a few years. And I like to mention that because um, it's really helped me, those experiences really helped me develop my leadership skills um, by being able to practice and hone them in a low risk environment and then be able to take that experience and apply it to my job. Um, so one really great um, thing that came out of that beyond the community and the exercise and the hobby that is roller derby. Um, besides that, I, I do like to hike as well. So I'm completely for the, the group because I don't like to do it alone. Um, and I have pets, friends, and family. Um, I like mindfulness. Um, we've done a meditation program in the planetarium here. So I like to journal. Um, and just try to maintain a good work and life balance. Dana, you have to share your uh, roller derby name. Do I have to though? <laughs> um, no, uh, so my roller derby name, um, so we all have roller derby names, most people anyway, some people just go by their, their birth name, um, but my roller derby name is Cosmo Pain because I cause more pain, but it's Cosmo and Pain um, put together. I love, I love that. That's, that's excellent. So um, we thank you everyone so, so much for sharing a little bit about your personal lives. I know it's not always easy to talk about yourself and it might not be easy to talk about your personal life, but I, I do think it's valuable for people to know that, you know, all any professional is a, is a whole person who has um, interests outside of their uh, career as well. Um, and everyone has such interesting uh, hobbies and things they do at home. Um, we do have a, a few uh, questions from our viewers. Um, 
uh, Corey, by the way, Mary thinks that pictures of your nieces or are adorable and that uh, Dana's roller derby is so cool. Um, so uh, we have a question from um, Steven. He wants to know if any of the panelists here have a preference for using open space software in their planetarium shows. And if you um, have an answer, just go ahead and unmute yourself, please. I do. Uh, we use open space a lot, actually, in our planetarium. Um, so uh, one of the shows that we do every day uh, at 4.30 is a completely live uh, tour of the universe where we basically we start out at Earth and zoom out into space and then come back home at the end. Um, and we do that with open space. So we um, are using open space every day. And we also um, do uh, live streams with open space sometimes. So while we were closed, while the museum was closed, um, we did a couple of, usually a couple of live streams per week um, that were using open space. But, um, and that's partially because uh, the California Academy of Sciences and the folks in the planetarium, we are on the uh, NSF grant that is part of the open space project. So we're one of the uh, partners on that, that project. So we're pretty, closely involved with open space. And I'm a fan. I like it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's got some, it's continuing to grow and get more ways to use it and more user-friendly ways to use it as well. But um, it's a really cool way to explore the universe with actual real pictures and data uh, from places like NASA. So that's really cool. Thank you, Mary. Um, and we have another question. Um, fr uh, from one of our, our Facebook watchers who wants to know if our planetariums have developed materials that are accessible for people with um, disabilities. So I don't know if anyone has a, an answer for that. Um, maybe Mary, you just shared. So maybe if anyone else has an answer for that that they'd like to um, respond to. Um, so something that we're working on right now is, um, and I wish I had one next to me, um, we are working with a company who is producing some tactile domes for us. Um, so they are just about, they're about this big um, plastic uh, domes that have kind of um, embossed star patterns on them. So um, we're hoping that we can use those for those who are visually impaired when they come into the planetarium can follow along with the show as we are uh, narrating it live um, and actually feeling on the dome um, what we are talking about. So all the different star patterns that we mention and kind of different ways that we can find our way through the night sky um, is reflected back on that tactile dome. So uh, that's something that we're actively working on right now. We don't have all of the domes just yet, um, but within the next couple months or so, we're hoping to uh, put those into practice. And they are very, very cool to use um, for anyone, basically, so you don't need to be visually impaired, but they are um, a really helpful tool. I could also chime in. Um, our physical space is uh, definitely designed to support uh, people with uh, physical uh, uh, mobility uh, limitations. Um, we, uh, you know, have lighting for uh, sign language interpreters. Um, so that uh, we can position uh, the participants that, that need that in the right spot. And um, we also have um, always a set of uh, tactiles on hand uh, that I can uh, bring up if we uh, have people uh, join us that, that are blind and, and can't see the dome. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think that it's something that um, if I might speak broadly for the group that a, a lot of planetariums are working on that I think a lot of us maybe aren't perfect yet, um, but are continuing to work on trying to make our spaces more accessible for all. Um, and it's an interest of, a, of big astronomy as well. There's a, a program that you can find on our YouTube channel about how you can adapt astronomy education to be more accessible to people who are uh, blind and visually impaired and um, we're working on, on captioning for the program. So it's it's uh, something again that I don't think the industry as a whole is is by any means perfect, but I think that um, it is it is working on becoming more accessible all the time. As I hope every institution is, because um, we can always improve. Um, but we are we are 
pretty much out of time. Um, so I just want to have a moment to say thank you so much to our panelists for sharing um, everything that you've shared today. I really appreciated you speaking with our guests and answering questions and um, being so willing to, to share a little bit about your life and your career. Um, and I'd like to mention that uh, Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded project and part of this project is that we have educational research that is being done on the program. Uh, by Michigan State University. So we're joined now by Dr. Shannon Schmoll, who will tell us just a little bit about how you can contribute to that educational research if you are so inclined. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So as your name mentioned, this is a National Science Foundation funded project. And so we are conducting educational research around uh, the various resources that uh, Big Astronomy has produced. So we would really love to hear from you and your experience uh, around this. And so um, we'll be dropping some links uh, to a survey. And if you fill that survey out, uh, you can uh, be entered in uh, for a chance to win a $10 Amazon gift card. So we'll be popping that into the chat, both on the Zoom and the Facebook page. So again, it'd be big help if you could do that for us and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, well, in closing, I'd just to say, like to say thank you once again to uh, Mary, Carissa, Dana, Jeff, and Mitch. Thank you all so much for your time today. I really appreciated hearing from all of you. And um, we have a couple of uh, accolades on our Facebook page. People have um, really enjoyed hearing all of these stories as well. So uh, tune in again for another uh, Big Astronomy Live event program. These will be ongoing through the rest of uh, 2022. So make sure you're following us on Facebook and check out our website for more information. Uh, thank you everyone and we'll see you next time.